morning we're declaring it. Thank you, church.
Jesus' blood. 
do the chorus again. Come on. Christ alone, cornerstone, we may strong in the same.
know that in this life, many troubles will come. That's what your word has told us. That the storms will come, the winds will blow. But you, Lord, are our firm foundation. You, O oh Lord, are our cornerstone. Christ alone. All other ground, church, is sinking sand. But we know we stand on the rock of ages this morning.
own words. Just thank Him. Just thank Him. Thank Him. Thank Him for getting you over this, this trial, this tribulation. Thank you for, thank Him for loving you through it all. Thank Him for showing you the way out. Thank Him for giving you wisdom this morning. You just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, we've got a reason to celebrate this morning. Our God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Come on, let's just give our God a huge round of applause. He's with us this morning. He loves us this morning. He's for us this morning. Amen. 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 What an, what an awesome time in the presence of God, you know. Pastor B, so amazing. She she asked me this week, uh, would you service lead? And as I was just lifting my hands and, and, and worshiping and, and beautiful voices lifting up to heaven, I just thought, sure, I'm not service leading. Holy Spirit is service leading this morning. He's leading us in, in all his truth and his wonders. And I don't know about you, but I feel that my, my eyes are open in wonder this morning. God is doing great things, amen. Why don't you take a few moments to greet the people around you, turn to them and say, God is good. He's doing wonders this morning. Amen, 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 amen. Well, church, welcome to City Life Church this morning. You have chosen a great Sunday to be in church. The weather's warming up a little bit, so good on you for coming and making it here. We're so excited to have you with us. If you are a new person here, this is the first time or first time in a long time, we want to just say thank you for coming. We welcome you. We love you already. And we already see you as part of our family. So um, if you are new, we want to just acknowledge you. Why don't you just give me a wave right now? And I want to wave back at you. So if this is your first time, come on, give me a wave. And our awesome City Life um, Church is just going to give you an awesome round of applause just to say we love you and welcome and welcome. I'm not sure if I saw any hands, I might have missed you, but if you are here for the first time, um, you, uh, one of our awesome hosts would have popped a welcome card in your hand. If you don't mind just filling that in, we'd love to just connect with you and pray for you. And um, as the baskets go around, you can just pop that in the baskets. Amen. Well, church, I also want to say that here in this church, we are a church of all generations, because God is a God of all generations, and um, we have an awesome and thriving kids ministry uh, that's happening right now as I speak at um, the Cinema One. This is some of the awesome things that get the, that they get up to every Sunday. So if you've got a little one from the ages of three to twelve, then this is where they need to be every Sunday. It's awesome. Our leaders always have a smile on their faces. I think today they have a crazy hair day theme, so it's it's packed with so much fun and awesome goodness. Woo! Doesn't that look like fun? <laughs> if you happen to not see me in the service, you know where I've snuck out to. <laughs> um, but church, it's awesome that we are a church of all generations, and we want to encourage you um, to let, get your little one in our city, kids. It is amazing. Well, church, without any further ado, it is time for the offering. <laughs> Woo! And I have the privilege of bringing the offering motivation this morning. Well, church, many of you um, know me, and I've said this a number of times. Those of you who are new, who don't know, I am a teacher. I love being a teacher. It is exciting. It is awesome. Of course, like anything, it has its bad days. <laughs> but it's awesome. It's really great. And um, I think as a teacher, you know, when you, you, you're kind of surrounded by young people and the youth, you kind of pick up on their, their mannerisms. <laughs> you pick up on their, like, they got a way about them or talk about them or walk about them, you know. They're like... Nothing can touch them. They're just so cool, you know. It's almost like you've got to move out the way for them a couple, you know, a couple of times in life because they just kind of, they just, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk and they just own it, you know. And of course, um, with the young generation, the youth, they've, they've got the their way of saying things, the way of doing things, you know. They're slang and they've got their young terms, you know, that they use. And I'm going to 
attempt to try and explain one of them <laughs> this morning. And, and um, you might know some of them, especially if you're a young one out, out here, or if you um, are a parent to a, a youth or a young adult. Um, one of the things, one of the terms they like to use is this word called giving, right? It's giving. <laughs> it's giving. Oh my goodness, it's giving. So for example, <laughs> so for example, I'm going to call up the lovely Candice, right? Just take a few steps forward so everyone can see. So if I'm a, right, if I'm a young person, let's pretend I am young for now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to say to Candice, oh my gosh, girl. Oh, your outfit. In fact, I won't even say outfit. It's like, it's outfit, it's too, it's too long to say, you know, it's only cool to, it's cool to say short, short versions of words. So they'll say your fit, right? Not outfit, your fit. Your fit is giving. Girl, your fit is giving. It's giving, you know, but it doesn't just extend to like the, you know, an outfit, you know, they can also Say maybe like your DP, you know, your display pick on, pick on your Instagram. Like, oh my gosh, girl. Okay, maybe not girl. Let's look. Oh my gosh, guy. You know, dude, your, your DP is giving. Like everything's giving. Wow. You know, and that's just how they, like your cat, your cat is giving. Your, <laughs> your dog is giving. <laughs> Everything is giving, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I love that. It's, it's, it's cool because, like, that's just how they talk, and you kind of get to pick up what they're saying. But the <laughs> someone's young out there. I see you. I hear you. But the frustrating thing is that I'm an English teacher, right? And so I struggle with incomplete sentences. Um, and, um, and so you say things like it's giving, but my first thought is it's giving what? Like, what it's, it's, giving, it's giving you frustrations? Is it giving you fear? Is, is the outfit giving you anxiety? Is it, is it giving you joy? It's give, giving what? <laughs> so that's the first thing I think, you know? But the amazing thing about our God <laughs> is that He's a God who always stays relevant, right? He is a God who knows the young, He knows the old, because He is a timeless God. In fact, the Bible is a book that is a time-traveling book, right? It goes through every time, every era, every generation, and it still remains relevant. And what I've learned listening to the young people and reading the pages of the old Bible is actually, church is only one thing that's really giving. And it's our God. Jesus is the one who's always giving. He, his nature is giving. His character is giving. He's always giving, right? In fact, John 3, 16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he's given. <laughs> he gave his one and only son for us. Second Peter 1, 3 says he has giving, he's given us all that we need for life and godliness. That is the nature of our God. And so church, in response to all this giving, <laughs> I don't know about you, but my response is I wanna mimic the character of my giving God. And I wanna be a servant of the Lord who is giving. <laughs> Amen. So church, why don't we just um, position our hearts this morning? Because God wants us to be like him. He wants us to have that giving nature, right? So this morning, let's prepare our hearts. There's so many ways that we can give here at City Life Church. And all these ways, might I say, are giving. <laughs> we have um, our credit card facilities and our welcome desk. You see what I did there? <laughs> we have um, EFT and, of course, I love it. We have snap scans. So church, uh, we're going to stand. Um, the band's going to come up and lead us in a song. The hosts are going to come around. And come on, let's give to God our highest praise. Amen. Yeah. 
we are filled with your joy, Father, because we are cheerful givers this morning, Lord. Thank you, Father, for every person who's cheerfully sowed this morning, who has sowed even in tears. We know that your word says we sow in tears and we reap in joy. Father, we pray right now, Lord, for every person who's, who's given, Lord, um, a sacrificial seed, Lord, that your, your, your covering would just come upon them, Lord Jesus, that they would recognize that any seed that is sown towards the kingdom is seed that's sown in good soil. And Father, I pray this morning that we would um, recognize that you are our provision. You alone are our provision. You alone are our source. You alone supply every single one of our needs according to your glorious riches, Father. And I thank you, God, that this morning you are going to do great things, Lord, with the seed that we have sown, Father, that it is going to produce a hundredfold, Lord, and that there will be testimonies, Father, that come from our faithful people sowing into the kingdom of God. We thank you, Father, for all you're about to do in us, for all that you're doing through us, and we thank you, Lord, for all that is going to happen throughout this encounter. We praise you, we bless you, and Every person in this place said, amen, amen. amen. Woohoo, yeah, let's give God a round of applause. Woo, <laughs> I feel the excitement this morning. <laughs> That's because Pastor V's in the house and she's gonna bring down the house <laughs> in Jesus' name, woohoo. Well, why don't we take our seats this morning? Um, it is an awesome time because we're gonna get to find out all that's happening in the life of our church. So why don't we turn our attention to the screens? This is Church News. Good morning, City Life Church, and a very, very warm welcome to you all. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning. Hey, church, this year we want to grow deeper in devotion and more intimately with Jesus. So why not join us on Tuesday, the 30th of April for a time of powerful prayer and worship at our Lone Hill location between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. That's right, with winter approaching, we would like to help those in need and we'll be collecting items to help those navigate the cold. We'll be collecting items like jackets, jerseys, scarves, beanies, mittens, and even soup sachets. This is gonna be used to help our community during the cold season. So why not drop off these items at the welcome desk or drop them off at the Joseph Project trolley um, after Sunday's experience. That's right, Candice. And remember, church, God loves a cheerful giver. Well, we also have amazing ways in which you can get connected to our City Life Church family. And one of those ways is to serve. So why not join one of our amazing volunteer teams and grow deep in community within the church? So if you would like to volunteer in any of our teams, you're most welcome to join the hosting team, City Kids, Media, the Welcome Desk, Technical, or the Worship Team. So make sure you pop on over to the Welcome Desk on your way out, or send us an email to info at citylifechurch.co.za. That's right, we can't wait for you to be part of all of our teams. Well, our Financial Freedom course um, provides solid biblical financial teaching. It also helps um, give you insight and equip you on your personal finances. We're going to start our Financial Freedom course. This will kick off on a Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. And this will run for seven weeks. And this is awesome because it is online, so it's extremely convenient. And we'll start at the 7th of May. So why not walk on over to the welcome desk after the encounter or send an email to info at citylifechurch.co.za. Well, Wendy, that brings us to the end of our church news for this week. We hope you have an awesome encounter and we'll see you next week with more church news. Well, 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 so much happening at City Life Church. How you doing, City Life Clearwater? <laughs> so good to be in the house this morning and I just want to apologize for Pro Presenter. It's giving this morning. It's given us a lot of hassles. It's giving. Actually, it's not giving. If it was giving, <laughs> it would give up. <laughs> but um, isn't it good to be worshiping and being together in the house of the Lord this morning? It's getting a little bit colder and I do apologize. I have a slight cold, so if my voice gets a bit husky, uh, or I go into a sneezing fit, it's all part of today's plan. Amen. <laughs> 
so, you know, I want to tell you a story. I want to kick off with a story, if that's okay. Um, some of you may know this about me, and if you don't, then you're going to get to know this about me pretty quick. But when I was young, I loved all kinds of sports. Things have changed as I've gotten a bit older. Um, I do believe couch surfing is a <laughs> sport. Um, but I used to do netball and running, and I did every kind of running from long distance. I was a sprinter. Um, I did the relay race. I even did cross country. Anybody know what cross country is? I did all kinds. And I guess because I'm a tall girl with, with daddy long legs, I was able to fit into all of the categories, which is really awesome. And so I absolutely loved running running. And, um, you know, I'd literally, when I'd get home from school, I'd go for a run, <laughs> which just feels so random. But I would. I'd go running and look at the neighborhood. And um, so I was on the team and I was on the relay team, you know, where they pass the baton over to you. And I don't know if you know how they structure the team, but there's four runners in the team and they always put the one that's going to get you across the finish line the fastest in position number four. And so I was really, really privileged to be the fastest in our team. And so I was on four. And uh, I was standing there and I'll never forget this moment, really so excited because we had a good team. How many of you know when you've got a good team, you just know you're going to knock it out the park and anyone could be in position four because we were all great. And so off they go and the, 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 the gun gets shot and Number one starts, number position two starts, position three starts, and I'm like this, like, yes. And I'm watching our team, and I can see this is a victory. And I'm looking across the field, and I see the podium, and I see that first pillar's position, and I, I can picture all four of us huddling together on number one on the podium. I can feel almost, I can kind of feel that finish line tape as I, as I run through it, you know, that moment where you feel the tape. I can hear the sound of the cheering for our team. I am winning in my head. And as I grab the baton, I look ahead at the finish line and I give it my all. And I run with my whole heart, looking ahead, not looking where I was running. And back in those days, in primary school days, you would run barefoot. And of course, off I go and we are winning. And my foot, my barefoot it's a sharp stone that is on my lane. And within seconds, say seconds, I think it was a milliseconds, I just dropped to the floor in agony. It was sharp, it was sore. I was running the fastest I could, so it was really tough. And I, I picked myself up and I got my baton and, and I, I, I kind of couldn't really run because it was so sore. And as I was trying to get to that moment that I had envisioned, you know, the finish line moment, I saw team number two come past, team number three come past, and team number four come past, and there I was still limping along, and I was so embarrassed, I was so devastated, I finished the race, but we came stone last, pardon the pun, <laughs> I feel like that's where it came from, am I right, like that stone was giving. <laughs> we came stone last. And you see, the problem is that I had focused on the promise of the win and I took my eyes off the process to get to the win. I had looked and I'd seen and there's nothing wrong with having a vision for your life, amen. We need to have those things. But when that distracts you so much that you are not paying attention to now, you can hit your foot on a stone. And so I was really disappointed. I felt terrible. My team had worked so hard. They set me up to win and I let the whole team down and I was so young and I, I just said to my coach, you know what, I just, I'm not cut out for this. I feel like I don't think I should run anymore. And my coach said to me, you know what, B, you're on the team because you can run. That's why you're on the team. And he said, don't let one fall stop you from winning. Stay on the track. And I, I remember feeling, because I was so young, but I didn't win. <laughs> and the stone did stop me from winning. Ever had that feeling when someone's trying to encourage you and you're like, yeah, but no, 
<laughs> I didn't win, and I did fall, and I didn't finish the cross across the finish line, and it didn't make sense at the time, but then I remember those words that kind of played slowly in my head. He said, don't let one stone stop you. Stop right there. Don't let one stone stop you from what you know you can do, which is to win a race. Don't stop because you fell down once. Get yourself back up, get back on the field, and go again. This time, you're different. This time, you do better. This time, you know better. And so, of course, a week later, because this is how often these things come at you when you're in an athletics team. Next Saturday, we're running again. There I was, and... The pep talk, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get back out there. And I remember focusing my mind and I thought to myself, you know what? Not on my watch am I going to stand on a stone again and let my whole team down. So this time my warm-up's going to look a bit different. And I found myself taking a little jog around the whole perimeter as my warm-up lap. And I looked at every single lane and I said, is there anything that I could tread my foot on that could hinder this? race because I've been there before and I'm not about to let it happen again and I want you to know that I saw it differently because of a past experience I was able to take the race again how many of you know we won that race we all four stood on the podium on number one together and we cheered and we forgot about what happened yesterday or last Saturday because the victory was ours but I want you to know that I put my focus on on where I needed to put my feet in the race instead of where I was going to put my feet on the podium. I needed to see what was right in front of me, not what was in the distance in front of me. Sometimes in life, we look at the promises of God, but we don't realize there's a process to the promise. And so we neglect the process because we're so fixated with the promise. Can I preach this today? Come on. And so you see, the victory didn't come because the race changed. The race was exactly the same, but how I ran it was different. How I ran the race was different. Why was it different? Because I took what I knew now and I put it in practice with the next thing that came my way and I was able to take a step up, to take my next step and to do better. Come on, tell your neighbor, do better. I want you to know the race doesn't stop because you had a fall. And I really feel like that's a word for someone here today. Your race did not stop because you fell. It is still your race and you can still win this thing. And all you got to do is get up and dust yourself off. Yes, maybe something got under your foot. Maybe you came stone last, pardon my pun. But your race is your race and it's not over until you win it. Amen. And so this is not going to be the year where you say, well, I took a fall. I really feel like the Lord is saying today, get off the grandstand like a coach. Come on now. I understand that you needed to take a minute, but you've been sitting on the sideline for too long in your race, not in other people's races, in your own race. And he has a finish line with your name all over it. And it's time to get up and get back out there. Amen. Tell your neighbor, get back in the game. And so I said all of this to tell you that the title of my sermon today is called Stuck on a Step. Stuck on a Step. You know, so often in life, you want to get to the first floor, you've got to climb a set of stairs. Some of us take the elevator, no matter which way you do it, you've got to go up. Am I right? <laughs> and sometimes we get stuck in one of the steps on the way to the things that the Lord has planned. Sometimes we get so fixated on the things the Word of God promises us, we skip over the part where God tells us how to get the promise. And we're like, God, where is this thing you promised? You said, but I don't see it. And so today I want to read a portion of scripture to you that really blesses my heart. And I'm hoping it would bless yours too, because 
my mind has been really drawn to the, the Psalms and to David. I love it when David writes a good Psalm and you feel it in your soul, am I right? And you say, I can find myself in that Psalm. And this week alone, I have found myself using the scripture as a pastor to encourage so many people on their journey. And I really felt today to bring it to you. Are you ready? So it's gonna come up on the screen and you might see Pro Presenter also come up. It's fighting for our attention. We, uh, we do apologize. We'll have that resolved for next week. But it's Psalm 37, verse 23 to 24. I'm gonna read it for you. It will be flashing on the screen from time to time. Um, but if you'd like to get your Bibles out, this is going to be the anchor verse for today. And I really want you to write this down somewhere in your life. If you put it on a little post-it on your fridge, on your computer screen, put it somewhere where you can keep it ahead of you and you can keep looking at it. It's Psalm 37, verse 23 to 24. And it says, the steps, say steps, of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I love this. This is one of those rah, rah scriptures. You know, this is the one where the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So when you're like, oh, I don't know, don't worry. Your steps are being ordered by the Lord. Come on, it's one of those, yes, I can get my faith behind this piece of scripture. It even says that even if I fall, the Lord is gonna catch me with his hand. It's power, am I right? It's great. And somehow when we hear that, we automatically think like, I don't know if you've ever watched The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy skips along the yellow brick road right into the promise. We feel like, yes, if the Lord is ordering my steps, I go from here to promised land with nothing in between. But I wanna circle back to the scripture and let's unpack it just a little more because the Lord gives us all the details we need to attain this promise. Notice that David says, the steps of a good man. The steps of a good man. When he says good man, he means all of us who are Christ believers in this room, men, women. The steps of a righteous person, they are ordered by the Lord. The steps mean, kind of imply that you don't just arrive, but that there is actually a process to get where God wants you to go. That's what steps mean. Steps mean that it's probably not going to be instantaneous. Sorry if you like two-minute noodles and all that stuff where you just put water, bing, and you're ready. No, this is not one of those. This is one of those... <laughs> pressure cooker for the whole day kind of meals. Am I right? This is where it's gonna take a little bit of time, but the Lord has promised that He is ordering. Say order. He is ordering our steps. Now, I want you to, I want you to feel safe. How many of you know that feeling safe is one of the most important feelings for a human being? Am I right? And what what it is in our life, we have fear and anxiety when something shifts and we don't feel safe. Is it just me? Or do we all have those moments where we're like, yo, I know the Bible says be anxious for nothing, but hello, have you seen my week? But this piece of scripture needs to make you feel safe. And I'm really hoping that by the end of today, well, not by the end of today, by the end of my sermon, you'll feel safe. Because the Lord has just said, he, the steps that you take, he orders. That's power. Now you're saying, yeah, but look at my life. Okay, we'll look at your life in a moment. But let it sink in that he is ordering the things around your life because he has a plan and a purpose for your life. There is safety knowing that as I take my next step, the Lord has just promised that he is ordering things in my world and that though I will fall, there, will, there might be a stone in my path, it will, not, it will not destroy me. In fact, he will uphold me with his hand. It's beautiful. 
And so there's no yellow brick road on this one. There's steps I've got to take. And he is ordering them. In the Hebrew original, it means he is establishing those things. So ordering means establishing with a strong foundation. So when the Bible says he is ordering your steps, he is establishing the steps you take with a solid foundation. If I circle back to my, my relay race, I wasn't even looking at the right things. I just wanted the win. I forgot that there was a process to the win. And so, yes, I did uh, have a stone incident, but it's thanks to the stone incident that I could train better, do better, have more experience, run faster, run harder, because I, I, I added a level into my, my fitness routine, if you'd like to say it like that, that accommodated something more so so I could be better. What's that advert? You only better. This is how the Lord wants to work with us. So he is ordering. In other words, he is helping us establish the right steps so that we can prosper in the way that he has designed us to prosper. Beautiful. I mean, you should be writing this, this, this scripture down. <laughs> And reminding yourself, God, you said that my steps you order. Thank you. This means that in our going out, in our coming in, in our lying down, in our waking up, in our sleeping, in our walking, in our baton race, no matter what it is, He is present. And He is ordering things, establishing things in our lives through every step you take. Beautiful. Why? Why would he want to do that? Because his plan and purpose for you is far greater than you could ever imagine. And he will do everything it takes for you to be everything he has invested in you to be. Right now you look at yourself and you see a little acorn. God sees an oak tree. You can't see the, the oak tree in your acorn, but everything the oak tree needs is already in your acorn. But how many of you know to become the acorn, and now we're using a tree as an example of our own self, that seed needs to get planted. We're just little nuts waiting to be put in the soil. And how many of you know that initially all we need is a little bit of rain and a little bit of dirt. And then once we poke our little heads out of the soil, we need a little bit of sun because the level has changed because we've come up a little bit higher and we've seen new things. But then all of a sudden that's not enough and we need the wind because the wind makes us stronger. Amen. And as we grow into this big oak tree, suddenly we need to learn how to be a big oak tree in a forest. There is always a progression in our lives to fully fulfill everything he has for us. And he says, I've got you because as you walk every step, I am there and I'm ordering those steps. And I want you to know that though, David uses the word though, though is not like a suggestion like it could happen to you. No, though is like, it's inevitably going to happen. At some point, you will fall. And when you do, you will not be destroyed because he is going to lift you up. He upholds you. He upholds you with his hand. You see, his plan and his purpose for us all is that he wants us to live in the fullest expression of who he designed us to be. You are so unique. The world has never seen anything like you. Beautiful. Be you. Be 100% you. And don't go letting other people tell you who you are. Amen. The only one who gets to tell you who you are is him. Amen. See, God does not do anything by accident. You are no accident. You are here for such a time as this. There will never be a day where you're going to hear God say, oops, I did it again. 
<laughs> He's not going to say oops. Just like you don't hear Jesus sneezing in heaven because we are healed. <laughs> God is so big and He's so great. And we spend our life focusing on these things out there that are ours because His promises are yes and amen. But we think we're just going to appear. And the Lord's like, no, you can't handle that yet. You're going to stand on that podium, but to get there is a few steps in between. And I want you to know that God is not wringing his fists, his hands. Oh, I don't know how Mandy's going to make it through this one. No. Oh, I'm not too sure. Carl, I don't know. <laughs> oh, let's touch and go on this one. No, he knows. He's ordered your steps. And he says, it doesn't matter what comes your way. I will use it. I will use it, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, do you love God? Give me a wave. Come on, come on. If you love God, do it, do it. It's good exercise. Do the other one. Yes, I told you I love sports. Come on, and we know for those who love God, all things, say all things. All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Well, I'm not a pastor. I don't have a... Mm, mm, zip it. You are called. You're a child of God. He has a purpose and a plan. And wherever your foot treads, He says, go and make disciples. Go love people on my behalf. Go do good. Go feed the poor. Go love people. Pray for people. Show them my heart. Invite them to church. Hallelujah. You see, no circumstances, whether good or bad, come to us apart from God's determining purpose for us. And you say, well, there you have it. I did blame God for that one thing. And now I know. No, 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 let me help you. God is overruling. When bad things happen, he will overrule everything in the whole cosmos because he is God. There is nothing we can do he can't undo. You can't put breath in your lungs, can you? But he can. He stands outside of our universe, outside. You got to zoom pinch back. Have you ever done Google Maps? You find your street and then you zoom back and you find your suburb and then you zoom back and you find, I mean, the whole area and you zoom back and what? This is the whole of Johannesburg. Zoom back, um, the whole of South Africa. Zoom back, Africa. How you doing? Zoom back, the world. That's where we end and he only gets started. He's like, zoom back more, I'll show you some planets. Zoom back more, let's take a look at the sun. Zoom back more, I've got a whole universe and galaxies you couldn't even describe. But he so loves you that he pinch zooms all the way back into you to order your steps because he wants you to live your best life in him. Isn't that beautiful? And so Psalm 107 says, Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love. His love doesn't waver. We think when we behave ourselves, He loves us. And then when we don't do so well, He doesn't. But He is not like us men and women who are fickle who decide if we love today, don't love tomorrow. He doesn't have a switch that says, I like you, I don't like you. No, he, his love is steadfast, it's loyal, it's always there for you. It is unchangeable. What does this mean for you and me? I can't wait to tell you. When your day is good, God is good. When your day is bad, God is good. When your finances are good, God is good. When your finances are bad, God is good. When your health is good, God is good. When your health is bad, God is good. Because God is good all the time and all the time. So if God says he uses all things, he can use anything. 
these things in themselves are not good. But he says, I will turn it for your good. How does he do this for us? He says, you know what? Because of that circumstance, I'm gonna pull you out. Because of what you had to deal with there, I'm gonna use this to deepen your devotion in me that's gonna take you to another level. Because you you were weak there, I'm gonna reveal your weakness in that moment and then I'm gonna come in and show you my strength. He says, no matter what you face, I will show you who I am and prove to you how faithful I am to get you through. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Every single circumstance is all there driving us back to God, our Father. Because it's through His Son, Jesus, we have the grace to be who we are, to walk this journey and become more Christ-like. And that's why we get to have the promises. Amen. And so he compels us to realize in every circumstance that what we are facing is temporal and what he has is eternal. And if we could just focus on his steps for our life, he will always be there to pull us up. And so God establishes our steps and he strengthens them through these things we go through. He uses them so that we can truly stand and say, I am more than a conqueror. You can truly say that when you've lost a few things and you made it to the other side, when you had kidney failure, but now you are healed, when you lost someone and the grief got you face down on the floor, but the Lord lifted you up and He gave you beauty for ashes. He gave you a garment of praise instead of a a garment of mourning. You can stand and say, come with me. I want to show you Jesus because I am more than a conqueror and He got me through. And so he uses all things. Back to Psalm 37 verse 24, it says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I don't know about you, but I'm like germaphobe. (laughs) I'm just touching stuff with my hand, except in a museum. I touch everything in a museum. It's old. But I don't just go around touching, you know, you go up a staircase, you hold on, unless you have to, don't. Because <laughs> the, the germs, God's like, it's such a personal thing. When you start dating, the first thing you do is hold hands. And it's intimate, it's special. And he says, I uphold you with my hand. It's like, imagine if you were a little child walking along, along the, let's take you, you go to the beach and there's the waves crashing in and you're walking with your dad and he's four times your size and you feel safe. Even though the waves and the tide is coming in, he's got your hand. He doesn't have your one little finger, he's got your hand. And if that wave comes, he will lift you up so that you don't get dragged out into whatever tide is coming your way. That's you and that's him. And the Bible doesn't say if it happens. The Bible says, though you fall, though there will be times that you're not gonna get it right. You're not gonna have everything in place. You're not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna win. You're not gonna get the certificate. You may lose the job. You may have a health problem. You may have a marriage that has broken up. You may have a child who has turned to drugs. Though these things make you fall, I will uphold you with my hand. These things will not destroy you. Praise the Lord. We see this all the time when we look through the stories in the Bible. We watch human beings that the Lord has a plan and a purpose for doing life and they fail and then they rise up and they fail again and they rise up again and we fall again and again and trouble comes for us again and again and we struggle again and again. But the Lord says, I will lift you up again and again and again. You will never be destroyed because I I am ordering your steps. But Lord, I lost that job. 
that's okay. I'm going to give you such a good job, you won't even remember the job you did have. Will you walk with me? Will you commune with me? Will you let me hold your hand so that when you stumble, I got you? He says, I want to, I have got you. Would you hang on to me? When you lose your way, I will direct your path. When you lose your way, I will make it so that you will turn to back, back on that path. Have you ever done a hike? Well, we're going to do hike on Saturday. Please come to that. Bring a picnic. It's going to be wild and fun. And the crew leave you. And you're like, which way? Now there's a fork in the road. You know the good news about most hike trails, and T will tell me if I'm wrong here, they all circle back to the beginning at some point. So you may have started doing a 5K hike, and you come home having done a 19K hike, but look at you now, <laughs> stronger, better for it, amen. It, the Lord has a way that even when you have a fork in the road, He will make sure if you took a left instead of a right, that He will get you back on track. And it may be a little bit of off-roading for a bit. Sometimes we make silly choices, am I right? We still have this thing called free will. One of the biggest gifts anyone could have. The Lord let you choose Him. He made you. And He didn't make you to bow at Him and demand it. He said, you pick me now. That's beautiful. And so what do we do? Why, why does He need to order our steps? Why do we need to know that He is ordering our steps? What is the reason for our steps being ordered? Now, let me tell you, he's not sitting with a clip chart going left, right, left, left, right, left. Hey, le <laughs> he's not doing that. He's letting us walk our free will. And when we go left and we're supposed to go right, he says, I got you. I'm going to lift you. you. You go. You're good. You're good here. Have you ever seen a kid on a bike for the first time? You take the training wheels off. Ooh, you're going to run. <laughs> and they're like, hey. And the parents are running like crabs. You know, I'm going to catch you. The Lord's like, I got you, even if I have to run like a crab. Well, Scripture tells us He's ordering our steps so we can be transformed into the image of Jesus in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And transformation is a process. He wants you like Him. He wants you to have all the promises of God. And so to get there, there's a little bit of a few steps that need to happen called transformation. And to be transformed, you need to take a few steps. We all want it now. You know, we're like, why can't I have it now? And let me help you understand this with a, a practical thing. You know, I've got a niece who is three years old and she gets dropped off at kindy, kindergarten every single day. Now, I might have it in my heart, please Jesus, let there be a day I can do this, where I want to give her a car. Imagine I say to her, here we go, Zara, here's a car, drive yourself to school. Would that be a blessing? <laughs> no, it wouldn't. But when Zara turns 21 and I come alongside her and I say, hey, how's uni going? You know, I'm given today, I'm giving you a car. Would that be a blessing? The car didn't change, but the timing did. And so you have to realize that the blessing is already waiting for you. The Lord is not trying to cook up a blessing quickly. Carlo's coming and he needs a blessing. No, the blessings are there. He's getting you ready for what he has. And he knows what he has and how much it weighs on you. And he says, let me see if Gloria can lead at this level faithfully. Because as soon as I see her leading faithfully here, I can take her up to the next level where she starts from scratch and learns how to be faithful in that level. TV games are not far off, you know, Prince of Persia, whatever you play. <laughs> Even Jesus had steps. He said, you can't crown me before you cross me. I can't be crowned. I first have to endure a cross. I have to go through that test. It's the cross that makes the crown have its value. 
it's the cross that gave the crown its authority. Amen. And so we all look and, oh, no, I'm not going to go through all of that. Thank you very much. Not for me. But I want you to know that these challenges we face are really there to prepare us and get us ready for what is coming down the line. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He's like, I I probably don't get it yet, but I'm getting there. (laughs) He says, I haven't made it, guys. I'm still making it. Amen. He says, but one thing I definitely do, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward what, to what is ahead, I press on. Say, I press on. That means he does not get stuck on a step. He presses on. Lord, it's so hard. I'm going to chuck in the towel. I'm never going to run again. I really sucked. No, there was a stone. You came stone last. Now go look for more stones and do it again. And next time you're going to win. Amen. (laughs) Get up off that couch and go do it. The one thing I do, I forget what's behind me and I press on. Promotion doesn't come from a stuck step. Promotion comes from a, a person who picks ourselves up and presses on no matter what that step looked like. Can I tell you what the devil really hates? He hates it when you hallelujah in a hard place. He hates hates it so much. When you're stuck on that step, if you don't know how to move forward, just start praising his name. Lord Jesus, I don't know which way to go, but one thing I do know is for sure, I'm gonna praise your name, hallelujah. And so I I just want to quickly give you three short points, and then we're going to wrap up today. The first point is that pressure has a purpose. The pressure in your life that you feel right now, God is using it. And it may not feel good, and it may not feel like God is using it, But God wants you to be who you are and he will use the circumstances around you to bring the authentic you out so he can bless you with everything he has for you. Not the guy next to you who arrived in a Ferrari, you. Maybe you're not gonna drive a Ferrari, but maybe you're gonna have the most beautiful family that's gonna impact a neighborhood or a city I don't know what's worth more, guys. (laughs) Life is going to crush you sometimes, but nothing else is going to get out of you the hidden treasure that you have locked up inside of you. We were talking about cooking earlier today, Alicia and I, and we're saying, have you ever snapped basil and put it into a spaghetti bolognese? You know, basil on its own has a smell, but the minute you snap it, the minute you crush it, you get the fullness of that basil and you feel Italian. (laughs) And it doesn't matter what the rest of the recipe looks like. It's amazing. (laughs) Is it just me? I'm giving all my cooking tips away here. (laughs) Come on. There isn't a great person in the Bible that wasn't propelled forward because of pressure. Look, go, look, go do the research. You're not going to find it. The grape was raised to be crushed. Why? Because the grape in its most powerful expression is wine. It's potent, people. I'm just telling you. (laughs) Am I right or am I wrong? You can eat a grape all day long. They're sweet and cute. You can't drink wine all day long. It's got a potency to it. (laughs) And even Jesus had a process and pressure. The Garden of Gethsemane. You know, he was born to die. And anything short of him dying on the cross would have been a failure for you and me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for going through with it. He didn't have to. It's in the crushing We get the wine, we get the flavor, we get the basil. 
And I want you to know that it's in the crushing that we get to see the heart of God too. It's in the crushing. He says, when you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. If you don't pass through the deep waters, you don't need him. He says, but when you pass through, I personally, I will be with you. When you go through the fire, I'm in it with you. There are things you cannot learn about the heart of God unless you are in a position of pressure. That's when you lean in and say, God, I need you now more than ever. And he says, I am your present help in your time of need. And that relationship is there because of the pressure. Have you ever seen that aerodynamics of an aeroplane? Pastor Nick and I, we have this app and you can see planes flying over and you can say, oh, that one's going to Cape Town. Oh, look at them, Hawaii, here I come. From Lanseria. <laughs> it's ridiculous. We, we're living vicariously through all these people. <laughs> Do what it takes, guys. Do what it takes. (laughs) So I researched it, and I'm going to read this to you. Because I've always wondered, even since I was a little girl, how does this big chunk of metal get up in the sky? Then you add four or 500 relatively chunky people onto that. And if they pack anything like me, they are wearing six jerseys so that they can get their bag on. (laughs) Because it weighs the right amount. And so if you fly aeroplanes, you can help me with this, but the engine thrusts the plane at a speed. You hear it. It starts, all right? And then it starts taxiing and getting ready to go on the runway. And that aeroplane starts going at a speed. It's still on the ground, so the engine can run it, and it goes at top speed. And the faster the aeroplane goes, while it is going at that speed, how many of you know that the wing of the aeroplane is is curved at the top and flat at the bottom? And so as that aeroplane picks up speed, it's going faster and faster and faster. The airflow covers the top surface as well as the bottom of the wings. But how many of you know that because of the different surfaces, they have different pressures that work against each other that causes a thing called a lift. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Lift off. This is a scientific fact that if it wasn't for the pressure that was formed by the wind coming against this huge chunk of metal on the ground and the size and shape of the wings, it would never lift. But when that pressure gets to a certain breaking point, they work together and it lifts that airplane up into the sky. Some of you right now, you're on that runway and you're going faster and faster and you're like, Lord Jesus, help me. And he says, in just a short moment, you are going to experience this thing called the lift. Hallelujah. But guess what? Only pressure. You don't see airplanes going, that's a helicopter and even that has pressure. It's the pressure. It's the pressure that crushes the grape that brings the wine. It's the pressure. The second thing is small steps lead to big spaces. We so quickly want to be great. And the Lord has greatness on your life, by the way. I declare that. You are great. Tell your neighbor you're great. But the parable in Matthew 25, 21 to 23 But Jesus says, you are faithful over a few things and I will make you ruler over many things. He says, when you are faithful over this step, I will then be able to move you to that step. Why does God need you to be faithful? Can't he just like click his finger like a genie in a bottle and then suddenly we have all the things. Why God? Why the process? Why the steps? You're God. Come on. (laughs) Who do we sound like? Make the bread, make the rock bread. Well, how many of you know that if I was to ask Gabriel to come and play keys, which I will in a minute, Gabriel doesn't just come and play keys because randomly he just knows how to play them. No, Gabriel had to learn how to play keys. 
How many of you know that those keys can't play themselves? They need a faithful person who's prepared to do the time to learn the chords. Once you've learned the chords, you learn to read music. I don't know the order of these things, guys. Work with me here. But you get the gist of it. Once you hear the chords, learn the, the symbols and the music, you learn chopsticks or whatever that thing is. And then you learn Mary had a little lamb. Some of us here, no, no one here. Other people in another place, they go and they hear a rendition of Beethoven at Monte Cassino and they see people playing his music and they're like, oh, I'm buying the baby grand piano. And they get it positioned in their house. And by the way, don't we all love a baby grand piano? We all want one. So even if you didn't play it, just put it there. It's cute. But anyway, they say in six months, I'm going to play that thing. And they start and they start out well. But if you went and visited their home in six months time, there's going to be one of two things. Either it's covered in dust. Please don't, not a grand piano. <laughs> covered in dust and washing. Like the chair that you have in your bedroom. <laughs> where you're just not ready to pack the washing away. It just lives there for another two days. So I can't even, a week maybe, thanks T. Until people come, yes, you're going in the cupboard. <laughs> Aren't we all the same? Anyway, the dust. Or they can play you, Mary had a little lamb. They cannot play like Beethoven. Unless you are Beethoven with a musical talent that the whole world is missing out on right now, please start playing. But what they don't understand is that Beethoven had, first of all, had a musical inclination at a very young age. From the age of seven, he practiced for eight hours a day. And you know, he did live performances as a very young boy, but do you know that only at the age of 30, was he a sought-after maestro? And we all want the baby grand piano in the corner of the lounge. Anything, I'll just take a Casio keyboard this big. I'm like, I'm gonna sound just like him. And we think that we're just gonna step in. But we can't step in. A musician has to be faithful to the instrument. And the instrument is only as good as the musician is faithful. You're picking up what I'm putting down. And when those two align and meet, we're ready to take it from just practicing in the bedroom or the lounge into practicing in front of a church audience into recording an album. Because that's the progression. And the Lord wants you to progress. But so often we look at our step, we come with our three years of experience and we want the same respect as somebody with 30 years but you haven't walked and stood and climbed and failed and fallen and been pulled up and had to do that over and over again to get where they are. So we've got to learn as people that it's small steps that are gonna get you into big spaces, amen. My final point is that the Lord orders our steps to pull out our potential. You know, Jesus is fully committed to pulling out your full potential. So he will use every single step like he did with Peter, like he did with his disciples. He found Peter casting nets. Peter was teaching other people how to fish. Peter was cool. And you see, Jesus called him and said, you are a fisherman for fish, but I'm gonna call you to be a fisher of men. Same process, different outcome. So often we think we're gonna see something completely different when the Lord is done with us. I'm gonna go from preaching, next time you see me, I'm a tap dancer. <laughs> and I can assure you, that ain't happening. <laughs> I tried it once and um, I got stuck on that step. <laughs> You see, the Lord wants to use you and it's by his grace that God gives his power to work within you 
in every one of those steps to be renewed, transformed, developed, grown into the wonderful, beautiful human being that he has created you to be. Keys, Gabriel, come and play those keys. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, for I know the plans I have for you. He has plans for you. Do you know that the Lord actually has your life plan? There's a blueprint in heaven of all the wonderful, incredible things that he's going to do in your life for you and for the people in your world, for your family, your workplace. He says, I know. He knows. He knows the plan. Have you ever seen it like that? God, you know the plan. God, you order my steps. God, you uphold me with your hand. When we think of things like this, could we stop living in fear of what the enemy is gonna do? One day you can look at him and say, is that you? Where's the rest of you? we stop looking at left and right and you said this and they did that could we just take a moment to understand that there is one who knows you he knows you better than you know you and he says this he says for I know the plans I have for you you know man plans in his heart but the Lord's purposes prevail the Lord orders his steps You might want to be Beethoven today, but when you learn that you can't play like him, that fades and you start to think, what else can I do with my life? And you know, when you watch a kid, it's so exciting to see them explore and and find all the mysteries of, of like when they realize certain things aren't real and they realize certain things are real. There's some kids in the house, so I won't elaborate on that, but there's times in the year where some things are mysterious and we do treasure hunts, and then we find something, and we run to our mom and our dad, and look what I found. And the Lord's like, I know what I have planned for you, and what I have positioned for you, and the whole time that you are here, I am going to order your steps. So the next time something doesn't quite work out the way you'd hoped, Could you just take a moment and say, God, you know the plans you have for me. God, you said that you are going to order my steps. That means that you're going to orchestrate things in my life so that I will be strengthened, transformed, so that I can go from level to level in the call that you have for my life. And so even though I am facing this moment that feels like a crushing, Lord, in this pressure, could pure oil come out of it? Could pure wine come out of it? Could you do something powerful with it? That's not just going to change me, but it's going to change everybody around me because of what you have done in me. Could we start to look at our trials and our tribulations and the steps we get stuck on a little different today? I'd love it if you'd stand with me. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Right now with every head bowed in this place and every eye closed. Father, we just want to say thank you that you have this all worked out and that there is such a safety in our hearts and in our minds when we fully comprehend that you are in control. And Lord, even when the hard things come, that you use all things, even though outside of you, they are not good things, with you, you make them great things for us. 
And Lord, we thank You that even in the crushing, in the pressure, thank You, Father, that You give us beauty for ashes, wine for grapes, oil. Lord, we pray that each and every person in this place would take their wilderness oil, the oil that's produced in the hard seasons of their life and use it to glorify your name and to shine a light so that others can see what more than a conqueror looks like. And Father, we wanna thank you that as Psalm 37 says, you are ordering our steps. And even though we will have times when we will fall, you will always lift us up. You will always hold us up so that we would never be destroyed. Thank you, Lord. Right now, just in your own voice, just give him a little bit of thanksgiving right now. Just thank him. You know what he's got you through. Thank him. Thank him that he's going to use it all. Thank him that he doesn't never have a plan. He always has a plan. Thank Him right now that even though it was hard, you're better for it. You're stronger for it. Thank Him that even though you can't see it, you know now that He is working. He's ordering. He's laying out plans. He's busy orchestrating things on the background. Thank Him right now, church. Thank you, Lord. And now as we come to a close with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, maybe you're here today and you've never truly had the opportunity to invite Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior, to come in your heart. You've heard all about Him. You know He sacrificed on the cross. But up until today, you've never truly made a decision to to put Him on the throne of your heart, to follow Him, to serve Him, to worship Him, and to allow Him to transform you into the best version of you. Until now, you've never realized there's this thing called eternity and that He is the only way. Accepting Him is the only way we get to be reunited with our Heavenly Father for all eternity. And maybe you're in this place, you say, please, can I pray that prayer? That salvation prayer that says, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. If that's you and you've never prayed that prayer, or maybe you prayed that prayer as a child or many years ago and you've gone so far off the track, but today you've come home. If that's you, I'd love you to do a brave thing with every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you just pop your hand up so I can see who I'm praying for right now? We're all gonna pray together, but if you could just lift your hand right now, that way I can pray with you. Our host will come through and give you a Bible and a, and, a, and a card for you to fill out. It's gonna give you all the details on your next step of the journey. If that's you, if you could just lift your hand right now. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, just lift your hand. Say, pray for me, please, Pastor. I need Jesus. I'm not leaving without Him today. everybody in this place to say these words, say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I choose to follow you, to worship you, and to make you the Lord of my life. From today, I choose to praise your name, to walk in forgiveness, and to walk in the call you give me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins by taking my place on that cross. I choose you, I worship you, I choose to love you with all the days of my life in your matchless and powerful name and all of God's people said, amen and amen. Come on, can we just give all of ourselves a massive round of applause? If you did say that prayer and you'd love to get a card and a Bible, one of our hosts will make their way to you now. Otherwise, go through to the welcome desk straight after today's encounter and everything will be there for you. Don't rush off. Stay for a cup of coffee. Otherwise, God bless you as you go and we'll see you and do it all again next week. Bye-bye.